Thanks very much, Bob. I'd like to call Orla to the stage. So Orla's going to talk to us about clinical trials in ALS, past, present and future. Orla Hardiman. Uh, thanks very much. Actually, most of what I'm going to say is, or has been said already um, by my ex-mentor, Bob Brown, who stole my thunder, <laughs> uh, but uh, also by, by my colleague, Kevin, who's actually Irish by, um, by, by, by genealogy, um, and, and some, of, some of Kevin as well. So, so really, kind of, I'm, I'm sort of wrapping up, to some extent, on what other people said. So I'm going to talk a bit about clinical trials. I'm going to talk about drug development, uh, current approaches towards uh, treating ALS, why previous trials might have failed, um, the fact that clinical trials aren't only for drugs, and, and um, Kevin uh, alluded to that earlier, and ultimately, and I completely endorse what Bob is saying, it's a really exciting time, and really the future is now. We are looking at uh, ALS being a disease that um, I think within our professional lifetimes will, will be arrestable and, and, and eventually curable, and I, I'm absolutely certain of that. So the, what I suppose I've been charged with talking about is, is about clinical trials. And the first thing you have to think about uh, clinical trials is um, about the development of drugs. And, and really, when I was preparing this talk, I was thinking, well, you know, how, what's, what are the mechanisms by which new drugs are found? How do we find new drugs? Look at the drug, drug formulary that we have at the moment. How did they come about and how do we know whether a drug is going to work or not? So if you think about the way uh, drugs up to now, successful drugs, have been developed, uh, they've been developed really by three main uh, mechanisms up to now, and these, these have been really around uh, pre-existing knowledge, all the old Chinese medicines. The prepared mind, should I give you some examples, but a lot of drugs have been de developed by serendipity, and then the most recent approach, the sort of scientific approach that we have, has been around targeted development. And just to give you some examples, um, the uh, white willow uh, was known uh, for many years as being a source of a, a compound that reduced inflammation by, by Native American uh, Indians, and of course we derived the, the, uh, the protein chemist derived aspirin from that. We all know about opium, and opium um, is, uh, is from uh, the poppy, and we know that uh, all the opiates have been derived from uh, this, this original plant, and, and the belladonna, atropine, and hyacin, is, um, anybody who's read Nathaniel Hawthorne in, um, in, uh, uh, based in New England in the Scarlet Letter, there's a very good description of, of poisoning by atropine but from belladonna alkaloid. So these, these drugs have been, and Nathaniel Horton wrote in the, in the 18th century, so these drugs have been known for a very long time, and their medicinal effects have been known for a very long time. And there are um, drugs um, that are still being developed from these um, old um, uh, knowledge sets. For example, a company called Phytoform in, 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 in Europe is, is, is developing a series of drugs uh, based around ancient Chinese medicines. So we should, we should be aware that this is a a good source still of, of, of um, drug development. The second one, of course, is the story of um, Alexander Fleming, who stated that when he woke up just after dawn on September the 28th, 1928, he certainly didn't plan to revolutionise all medicine by discovering the world's first antibiotic or bacteria killer. But, of course, he did, and he discovered the effect of uh, penicillin, which was um, uh, fortuitously had contaminated the um, culture dishes that he had, a bacteria which he'd left on his windowsill. The story was that the um, scientist on the floor below him, who was actually um, a graduate of Trinity College Dublin, um, who was interested in mould, um, had left his window open and the mould had flown up and, and, and um, had contaminated Alexander uh, Fleming's dishes and uh, led to the discovery of penicillin, which ultimately led to one of the greatest discoveries um, in terms of treatments. Um, uh, what is interesting, I think, to know, and that people, most, a lot of people don't really know this, is that uh, Alexander Fleming made his discovery in 1928, but actually penicillin didn't really become valuable until the, mid, until the beginning of the 1940s, just before Pearl Harbor, actually. So there's quite a lag time of about 16 years between uh, the discovery of penicillin and its um, translation into a, a, into a compound that was useful, or commercialization, I should say, of the compound. And, there, and, it, and it's paid, it was paid by many failures, which are worthwhile remembering. Uh, that, that good drugs can fail early on um, in the process of commercialization for reasons that are not due to their benefit, but due, due for, for commercial reasons. And it was fortuitous. In fact, Alexander Fleming had given up the study of penicillin as a potential therapeutic um, sometime in the mid-1930s, and there was another group um, who developed it as a therapeutic, its therapeutic potential by treating 
um, uh, parenterally or giving it uh, orally rather, rather than using it as a topical compound, which is what Fleming was, was looking at. So it's important to look and to remember. Of course, the third possibility of de drug development is serendipity, which is something like the prepared mind as well. And there's a big list of drugs here uh, that were discovered by serendipity uh, to draw your attention to a, a, a compound called um, sodium valproate, which is a very useful anti-epileptic drug. It's in the list, listed there. Uh, but uh, sodium valproate is actually a solvent that was used and was used, shown to have an anti-epileptic properties rather than the compound that it was, it was um, dissolving. And um, similarly, uh, warfarin, which is uh, otherwise uh, had, been had been developed as a rat poison, was discovered because uh, some unfortunate uh, person um, overused uh, Coumadin as a, as a potent to, to try and uh, commit suicide and didn't actually die, but had a, a slightly very prolonged um, bleeding time, and, and out of that was developed um, um, warfarin. So, so serendipity is, is a very important uh, dr drug development, and we should always be keep our minds alert to the fact that there may be um, observations that, that, that are still to be made in terms of new th therapeutics. Nowadays, of course, we, we uh, refocus on targeted drug development, and this is just a cartoon, I think, really, of what the previous speakers had been, uh, had been talking about. Bob talked mostly about uh, the gene locus and the cell biology around that. Of course, we're best friends with the medicinal chemists and then the, uh, what Kevin was talking about, about in vitro therapeutic development, uh, leading on to the animal model, which at the moment is the SAD1 model, which, of course, uh, leads on to clinical trials. So this is a sort of a cartoon of how we d d d develop drugs now. So the current approach towards ALS development is around targeted drug development, and really over the last uh, 15 years or so, it's really been focused around the use of the SOD1 uh, mouse model, which Bob so eloquently described a few minutes ago. And the SOD1 mutation, which is identified actually um, in Bob's lab, along with Tipa Sadiq, in uh, 1991, uh, and, ultimately, and led to the development of the SOD1 mouse in 1993, and then ultimately the development of other uh, um, animal models, which Bob alluded to uh, there, the, um, both motor neuron cultures, uh, and, and of course these have evolved into uh, uh, um, um, embryonic stem cell-based cultures leading to motor neurons, the SOD1 mouse, the SOD1 fish, the SOD1 fly, the SOD worm, I'm sure there'll be other SOD1 models as well. So these models have been very useful in terms of developing drugs, and these are, this is what's called preclinical development, so laboratory-based drug d discovery and development. And the role of the laboratory model, I think we need to remember that. It's really a model. The model is a key word there. And the role is really to understand and manipulate pathways, as Kevin mentioned, to use a sort of his analogy of using a sort of a flight recorder of what might go wrong in the cell and why. But of course, there's quite a lot of work to be done between uh, understanding what the biology of what's going on in, the, in the, the Petri dish or in the mouse, and of course, translating that into a much more complex organism that is the human. So it also, the, well, the second purpose, of course, is to try and change the course of the disease by targeting pathways, and that's what drug discovery is about. It's about adding compounds that we know uh, may affect a, a particular pathway, measuring the outcome of that um, in terms of the change in the pathway, and then trying to extrapolate from that what might happen in animals and ultimately in humans. This is another iteration of this. I think this is the fourth time this uh, iteration has been shown, and this is a cartoon based on what might go wrong in the cell uh, in, the, in response to um, the presence of an abnormal uh, SOD1 protein. As you can see, pretty much anything that happens in the cell uh, can go wrong uh, in the context of SOD1. And it's, it's taught us a huge amount about the biology of motor neuron disease and has led to the development of quite a, a lot of uh, potential therapeutics, um, a huge amount of, 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 of science uh, um, has been based around uh, these pathways. Um, and what, was, what we've established from this is, is, is really a list, and, and uh, Bob um, uh, described this in more detail in his talk. Uh, we know that motor neurons are selectively vulnerable because of their anatomy. We know that there's a problem with protein aggregation and trafficking. Uh, we know that there's a disruption in the way the cells signal to each other. Uh, we know that um, there's a problem with, with the batteries in the cell, the mitochondria. Uh, we know there's something wrong with the RNA metabolism. We know that the motor neurons live in a very nasty, unpleasant, un inhospitable environment as well when there's a mutation in a, in a gene like SOD1. So it's, uh, they're sick neurons living in a nasty, unpleasant, um, uh, unneighborly neighborhood. Uh, now, one of the things that we need to remember, though, is that um, when we're looking at, at uh, 
for drugs, particularly drugs within the CNS and particularly drugs that are targeted at a, a very complex disease like, like motor neurons disease, and Bob uh, was uh, very eloquently described that, uh, that, that we, we need to really, I suppose, have a little bit of humility around this as well. And uh, this is taken from uh, Perspectives in Pharmacology, uh, so that modern drug development is, is focused on this idea that there are discrete molecular targets. And while that might be the case, it's something of a reductionistic argument. And we are sort of a little prone to this idea of uh, targophilia, which is that um, we're looking at a particular drug working on a particular target, whereas in fact most drugs, and particularly many drugs that are identified by serendipity, have many different actions, and, and one of the, the points um, I suppose made in this paper is that clozapine, which is a very, very successful antipsychotic agent for schizophrenia, uh, has its clinical utility based on multiple target points. So we need to remember that, that maybe drugs that are uh, operating a single tar target, while they may be important, maybe either using multiple drugs or using a drug that may hit multiple targets, also have the potential for benefit. So the realisation that this targophilic approach doesn't take into full consideration the complexity of these integrated, na native integration systems, such as uh, the human um, nervous system. So, so having said that, what, what do we do? How do we go about translating all of the biology that's happened within the, um, the last 15 years or so uh, that's allowed us to understand a lot more of what's going on, particularly with respect to the SOD1 model, translating that into a human setting? And why is that translation really stalled a little bit, even though we've known a lot, learned a lot over the last um, years, we still don't have a drug that really is, is, we can confidently say, will arrest the course of the disease or even reverse it. And I suppose that's the difficulty that we have. That's the big challenge, and I think that's a theme that's come out from the other speakers as well. One of the first things we have to do is step back and say, well, you know, how can we tell if a drug does work? Is there, is there some way of, of knowing a drug works? Because there are many confounding factors in testing drugs to determine whether they work or not. And, and one possibility is that the drug really works. Another possibility is that we think it works, but it doesn't really. So, so these are four cardinal, simple points. Uh, the, the person start, stops deteriorating, starts improving. Well, of course, that could be confounded because the person has a very slow course or, or um, has, has a condition that, that um, is a little bit atypical, they may stop or, or plateau, and it may be nothing to do with the drug. Uh, the effect can be reproduced in other patients, so you have to be able to show that the effect is, 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 is present in a large group of patients. Um, that you've excluded a placebo effect. Uh, placebo effects are very powerful, up to about 30% of an effect of a drug is considered to be possibly due to placebo. And, of course, we have to make sure that the observer, people like us, the clinicians who really want a drug that's going to work, who's really, who are really uh, keen on developing something that's really going to help our patients, that we're not blinded by our own desire for, for, for improvement in our patients and that we're over-interpreting uh, signs that would be otherwise uh, not, not, not be valid from a scientific point of view. And, and we do need clinical trials because the placebo effect is quite big. This is a study that we did where we looked at all the patients that we had had and a clinical trial that didn't work, actually, and, and, and patients who were, hadn't been on a trial. And you can see there's quite a shift. Now, there are many reasons for that, including the criteria that were used for introducing, uh, for putting patients in the trial in the first place. But the point is that um, being in a clinical trial of itself has a beneficial effect, some of which is placebo and some of which is a function of, of the factors that get you into the trial in the first place. Uh, so we need to exclude the placebo effect, and we need to exclude bias. And this is really important because... Um, so-called conventional science and the drug development along the conventional scientific route uh, adheres very firmly to the concept of the, the, the necessity of clinical trial, whereas, whereas um, unregulated drugs or, 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 or um, alternative drugs, drug therapies tend to avoid this sort of scientific paradigm of clinical trial, and often it's very difficult to, um, in, to be sure whether a so-called alternative therapy is beneficial or not because there aren't any adequate trials. And, and many of the so-called stem cell centres, and Kevin mentioned this in his, in his talk as well, that, that purport to generate a benefit in uh, following treatment are, are fatally flawed in, in, by, by the absence of these properly, strictly controlled clinical trials to ensure that all of the biases that can be inherent within a study have been dealt with. So clinical trials are really, once we get a drug past the animal and into, into 
uh, first in man into, into patients, uh, clinical trials are redivided into four uh, phases. So phase one is, is a safety study, which is really usually in, in people who don't have the disease, and it's just to see uh, if, if the effects in the animal are similar to the effects in man and if there's any unexpected toxicity within, within humans. Usually uh, studies in the preclinical phase do small animal and then do large animal and then go into man. Um, the second is a proof of concept or phase two trial. That's usually a small trial looking for what we call a signal, just looking to see if there's a, any kind of an effect at all of the drug and really looking to see if the, what the doses might be to, to, see, to, to look for a therapeutic effect. And then phase three is, is, is really the big uh, uh, sort of meaty part of the trial, and that's really the one that costs all the money. Uh, uh, the current uh, dexpramipexil uh, trial, which is being sponsored by Biogen, is, is costing about $40 million. Uh, so this is a very large, these are very large, very expensive studies. They're called pivotal trials. Usually in the U.S., the, the Food and Drugs Administration requires two of these trials to take place to ensure that the drug is efficacious and safe. And then phase four is post-marketing, and that's sort of, there's a surveillance that goes on after drugs have been um, have been under uh, have, have gone through uh, licensing. So why have the drugs that we've had uh, so far? Why have they failed? And 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 both. Um, um, Kevin and, 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 and Bob uh, put, up, put up a slide showing uh, some of the drugs that hadn't worked. But of course, the first thing is that we're not mice, uh, that, that, uh, the, that drugs that are efficacious in mice uh, aren't necessarily going to be efficacious in man because we're not mice. If we were mice, then maybe they would work. But there's a, there's a huge difference in the anatomy and the physiology between mice and men. Uh, so that, so there, there are problems... First of all, just at the laboratory level in the mice, and, and many of the original studies that were done in mice um, in the 1990s uh, were somewhat flawed as well, based on, on uh, confounders within the, the way the studies were done, uh, not taking account, for example, of the genetic background of the mice, not taking account of the gender of the mice, because we know that the mice behave differently, whether they're female or male, and, and um, of course, the anatomy being different between mice and humans, and also... Most of the studies that were done in my, are done in mice are done in the SOD1 mice, and the SOD1 mouse has the human gene inserted into it, but not just one copy, but many copies of the human gene. And, of course, the number of copies of the human gene that you have may determine how the mice behave as well in response to the drug. So if, if you're comparing a, a, a set of mice with a very large copy number against a set of mice with a very small copy number, there may be some differences in the way the mice behave as well. So there are some, so are some problems, particularly in the earlier studies, with respect to the mouse experiments, and, and um, there's been a, a review of the, the uh, 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 structures around how we perform mouse clinical trials now. It was published in, in our journal, the ALS journal, uh, a couple of years ago, some guidelines as to um, how mouse studies should be done, and then an analysis of previous mouse studies and the flaws therein. So, so I think we've learned a lot from our mouse studies up to now. A second limitation is quite an important one, which uh, both, both Kevin and Bob alluded to, are the fact that the mouse model, uh, which we were most comfortable with, is the SOD1 mouse. Of course, the SOD1 mouse is a little bit different, and we know that the, the pathology of SOD1 um, in humans who have motor neurons or ALS is actually um, a bit different from, from typical um, non-SOD1 um, pathology. So it may be what a lot of what we learned about the biology of what's going on with SOD1 uh, may be a little bit different from what's going on in non-SOD1 um, disease, and that, that might be important. We don't know as of yet the extent to which these, these differ, but there certainly are differences. Um, the second set of problems are, on the other side, the problems of the human studies. Um, of course, one possibility for why a drug might fail is because it doesn't work which is a, a very real possibility. But there are also other possibilities that we should consider in trials that have failed. And uh, um, our colleague Meritz Kodwitz, who's, uh, who's in, in um, the MGH, who's really, I suppose, the, the key clinical trialist who's moved LS clinical trials forward um, in a quantum way and is, is the founder of the group Niels that Bob, Bob referred to, has, has, has done quite a lot of work on this and has a very nice paper, uh, again, in the LS journal a couple of years ago, describing all the things that may, that may have gone wrong in previous trials where the drug may not have been at fault but it was a faulty design. And so, uh, so either the, draw, the, the design itself was faulty, the, the, the groups weren't proper, the people who were on the trial versus people who weren't on the trial weren't properly balanced, the dose was used that was wrong, uh, there was no marker to see if the drug did what it was supposed to be doing, there was no biomarker, so we don't know if the drug got to the right target 
or the wrong patient group was used. And this is uh, from Merritt's uh, paper showing uh, a number of trials that, that failed where she felt uh, the, trial, the drug failed um, unfairly, that, there, that um, the drug study was negative, not necessarily because of particular disattributes of the drug, but because the trial was poorly designed. And th these are the, the list of things, not, not enough patients, the dose is too high, the dose is too low, that we don't know if we use the right dose, there was no marker to make sure the drug went where it was supposed to go, and there was no accounting for drug interaction. So, so Merritt and her group feel that many of these drugs that, that appear to have failed maybe uh, should, are, are worth another look at uh, with better trial design. Um, the, second, the second thing is this idea, this concept of targetophilia, that neurodegeneration is a very complex disease and that maybe instead of looking for a magic bullet, we should be looking at a magic blunderbuss or a magic shotgun, that we should be targeting a number of different areas at the same time. So the idea of combination therapy uh, should be introduced or maybe drugs that work on more than one area. That's, of course, very difficult because a drug that works on one, more than one area is as um, our pharmacologist friends would tell us are dirty drugs and that they're much harder to characterise. But it is worthwhile considering that, you know, many of these disease, uh, motor neuron disease in its many iterations probably has multiple, uh, there are multiple areas that are targetable and that it's definitely worthwhile. And the same, using the same idea as cancer, that we don't just, just use a one single anti-cancer drug. We, we have a marker for cancer, for example, it's breast cancer is Herceptin positive or Eastern positive, and then we use a group of drugs that, are, that, are, that work at, at um, that particular target and its surrounding areas to, to, to be of benefit. I suppose another thing that we should remember is this idea that, um, and going back to what I mentioned about penicillin, that um, some drugs uh, may be potentially very beneficial, but for a variety of commercial reasons don't actually make it to uh, patients in the, the um, commercialization process is, is fraught with difficulties and there's a, a point uh, going from uh, the drug discovery uh, through to uh, phase three, which the uh, drug development people call the target at the valley of death, um, where basically the drug fails because of a lack of, of, of uh, resources or, or a, a lack of interest or, or a lack of, of drive. And um, uh, we, we had a workshop a couple of weeks ago in, in Dublin um, where uh, uh, this, the concept of the value of death was, was discussed in great detail. And one of the points that the, one of the, the drug development people was, made, was making was that actually a hugely important um, bridge around this so-called value of death is actually patient advocacy, advocacy groups. That, that if the patient advocacy groups get together and advocate in, in favour of the development of drugs that have potential therapeutic and get these drugs through this, this uh, valley of death um, uh, onto the, the potential clinical beneficial um, end, that that's actually quite a useful and very important way. And, and, and a good model of that would be the AIDS story, that, that the AIDS groups in the US were very active um, to, at, 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 at driving through drugs that were potentially beneficial uh, through this, this process uh, where many drugs might fail. So just last couple of points. Clinical trials aren't just about drugs, and, and um, Kevin talked about this. Uh, we've had a number of investigator-led studies that have um, not actually halted or, or slowed the progress of disease, but have had major effects on quality of life of patients. And we shouldn't forget that clinical trials are, not, are, are about management as well as, as drug, drug development. Non-invasive ventilation, Kevin mentioned, is very important. Uh, there are studies going on using diaphragmatic pacing. Um, there are studies... Uh, some of which have been very successful, looking at uh, symptom management, particularly around the management of, of emotional ability or, or, um, um, uh, in a, or laughing and crying uncontrollably and, uncontrollably, and there have been drugs that have developed successfully for that. Uh, so we shouldn't forget uh, those. And, and finally, I, I completely agree with Bob that I think this is a, this, there's a lot to be really um, uh, optimistic about now, uh, what can we do to resolve the problems that we have? Uh, the drug doesn't work. Well, we find more efficient ways of screening drugs, cheaper ways of screening drugs, using uh, Kevin's uh, paradigms, using um, IPS, using embryonic stem cells um, uh, to generate um, models uh, to look at targeted pathways. So we should have better drugs. Uh, we're now much better at clinical trial design. Um, that's thanks to a lot of the work of the Niels group that have really... Um, brought uh, clinical trial development in ALS um, uh, forward in a quantum way. Uh, we're much better now. We're working with our pharmacology colleagues. We're much better at, at looking at um, the correct dosages, making sure that we have the correct dosages before we get into uh, phase two or phase three trials. Uh, as, as Kevin mentioned, we're, we're, we're developing biomarkers. Uh, the uh, European um, uh, Commission 
uh, has set up a, a new program called the Joint Program of Near Generation, or JPND, and JPND just had a call um, for biomarker development. I'm happy to say that the ALS consortium uh, in Europe called NCALS put in a b bid for this and we've been, uh, we've been successful. So we're, we're, we've got a European money now to fund a big programme of biomarker development uh, around a, 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 a consortium of 14 or 16 uh, groups, including uh, Kevin's group in Oxford. Uh, being, this is being coordinated by Leonard Vandenberg's group in Utrecht. So we will have better biomarkers, biomarker development going on in the US. I'm sure there's biomarker development going on in this part of the world as well. Um, we're going to be much better at patient stratification. The new developments in genetics, the new developments in, in our understanding of the mechanism of disease have, have, will, will make it much easier and better for us to, to be able to stratify groups. It may well be that um, ALS is a, well, we know ALS is a heterogeneous disease. Uh, we will have to stratify according to these heterogeneities. Exactly how that stratification is going to happen, I think we're not quite sure about that yet, but I think that's going to be a process uh, the, um, that, that is going to be uh, move very quickly, particularly with the discovery of this new gene, the C9 or 72, which accounts for up to 8% of sporadic and up to 40% of familial motor neuron disease. So I think the future is very bright. I think uh, unlike the Wizard of Oz, um, this is, um, uh, the Emerald City is real. Uh, I don't think we have to wear emerald glasses to get there. I think that there will be uh, uh, new drugs that uh, are going to develop, and this is just an example of uh, clinicaltrials.gov. This is just one page of clinicaltrials.gov, which which is a, a NIH-sponsored um, uh, site, which uh, uh, lists every single drug trial uh, that's 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 uh, going on around the world. And uh, there are two, three pages listing the um, ongoing uh, actively recruiting ALS studies. And there's a, as Bob says, there's 150 other compounds waiting the sidelines to come into trials. So this is a, a really exciting time. The future is bright, and I think that we, we, um, we, we, we will get there, and we'll get there soon. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Orla. I'd like to ask all four speakers to come and sit up.